I'm Kristen V. Brown, Bloomberg News health reporter, and this is Illumina CEO Francis D'Souza. Uh, hi, Francis. Thank you so much for being here today. Thank you, Kristen. I'm glad to be here. Uh, before we start, I've been asked to remind everyone that my comments today could include forward-looking statements. You should refer to our SEC filings for a discussion of the risks and uncertainties that could cause results to differ materially from our current expectations. It's our intent that all forward-looking statements regarding our financial results and commercial activity made during today's discussion will be protected under the Private Securities Litigation Reform Act of 1995. So now that that's out of the way, uh, it's been a pretty crazy year. So I want to start out by asking you, at what point last year did you realize that your year was about to get really crazy, that genomics would have a really big role to play in what was about to unfold. You know, we were involved with this pandemic very early. So back in the fall of, of 2019, in fact, over the years, uh, it, whenever there's an outbreak, uh, typically we will work with the local CDCs to help identify the pathogen responsible for the outbreak. So for example, the Ebola outbreak or SARS. And so in the fall of 2019, sort of November, December timeframe, we were called into Wuhan to work with the local CDC and public health authorities to try and help them identify the source of the pneumonia outbreak of unknown origin that they were having. And so we worked with them and we worked with the Shanghai Public Health Clinic in January to sequence the first genomes of SARS-CoV-2. And those genomes were published on January 10th. Uh, the work was done by Dr. Zong's team at the Shanghai Public Health Clinic. And then over the course of January, we saw the outbreak continue to spread throughout China. And then it was confirmed that you could have human to human transition and that you were, you were having airborne transmission. And it became clear to us that this was one of the bigger outbreaks that we'd seen. And so we continued working with the CDC officials and public health officials in China, but then started to work with CDCs and public health around the world. In January 2, uh, around the world, uh, you had uh, the teams at Moderna uh, in the US, but BioNTech in Germany, that looked at the, the genome sequence that was published and started working on vaccines. And so both uh, Moderna and BioNTech are customers of ours, and we worked with them on making sure that they had access to the genomic data to drive the vaccine development. In fact, actually, even till today, both of those companies have never actually had the live virus on site. They've completely relied on genomic data coming off Illumina instruments. And then over the course of last year, we worked with uh, therapy developers. Uh, we worked with CDC uh, officials and, and public health officials. And then uh, it started to become clear that it was important to track how this virus was spreading and how it was mutating. And the reason you want to know how a virus is spreading is because that information drives policy decisions. So for example, in a community, if you see that the outbreaks are primarily coming from the outside, then you could do things like put in travel restrictions so people can't come in. Whereas if you're already having community transmission, then, then that won't work. And the reason you want to know why it's mutating is because you need to know if the tools you're using to fight the pandemic, the PCR testing tools, the vaccines, the therapies, if those are continuing to be effective even as the virus mutates. And so we were working over the course of the year with health officials and CDCs. And then by December, it became really clear that what was needed was a much bigger surveillance effort than we had had until then. And so we started working more broadly with national governments to help put together sequencing surveillance infrastructures. So I want to talk about variants and genomic surveillance a little bit more. But first, let's go back to, to last March. Um, so, or, or really even before that. So you mentioned that we had sequenced the virus with Illumina's help by January. I mean, this is incredibly fast that we had this information and it played a huge role in helping us understand how the virus spread from Asia to Europe to the US and, and not only how it was moving around the world, but how quickly. So, I mean, in that moment in time, do you think, what role did you think that genomics would play going forward? Was it, was it clear how big of a role it would play in the pandemic to you? I think it surprised everybody how important genomics was going to be in fighting this pandemic on, on so many fronts. One, in identifying uh, the source of, of uh, COVID and identifying and, and, and sequencing the SARS-CoV-2 genome. 
And to your point, it really is remarkable how fast that happened. And so it was really 10 days between the reporting of the infections to the WHO and the sequence being published. Now, for context, if you think back to SARS, that was 149 days. If you think back to the swine flu, it was 77 days. And so that happened really quickly. Another thing that was sort of a first of its kind was the emergence of these new nucleic acid-based vaccines, is mRNA vaccines. They truly are both scientific and medical marvels, right? So in, in, in the history of humanity, we've never had a vaccine for a coronavirus. And typically, vaccine development takes 10 to 15 years. But these new genomic-based uh, vaccines, the mRNA vaccines, you know, basically it's, it's software development. Once they had the code at, uh, at Moderna, for example, it was only a few days for them to design the vaccine. And in fact, it took 42 days from having the code to having the vaccine in clinical trials in humans. You know, that's remarkable. And so the fact that we had a vaccine a year after the, 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 the outbreak was identified, again, is sort of a, a medical first, a scientific marvel. And so underlying all that is genomics, right? So genomics was used to identify the outbreak, to identify the sequence, to help drive the development of these new genomic vaccines, to help drive some of the therapy development. Um, and then we found that genomics had an important role to play in understanding the research, uh, the, the, the mechanisms of the virus, how the virus is evolving, and also why some people tend to get a mild case of the virus, whereas for some people it's fatal. And so there's a lot of research that, that got undertaken to try and understand susceptibility, host susceptibility, and try to stratify people to understand who's more susceptible and who's not. And then, as I talked about, there's this whole area of genomic surveillance for pathogens that's now emerging, and I think that's something that's durable. You know, surveilling, surveillance is gonna be essential to help us navigate our way out of this pandemic, but then we'll need surveillance going forward to make sure that we are never as unprepared as we were for this pandemic. So, I mean, in some sense, we're really lucky that this global pandemic came along at a point in, in which genomics was, was so advanced as a technology. Um, why, though, is it important to be able to do things like sequence the virus quickly? Maybe you can talk a little bit about that, because I think, you know, people who are in this industry, we take for granted that people understand that that's a really big deal to be able to do all of this stuff so much faster and at a larger scale than we would have been able to in the past. You bring up a couple of really good points, Kristen. The first one is that uh, we are at a, at a fortunate that we're at this point in time uh, that genomics is really so accessible and, and the price points of genomics have come down so much. Uh, when we released our first sequencer back in 2007, it cost about $150,000 to sequence a single human genome. Today, you can sequence a, a genome for under $600. And so that's just from 2007 till today. If PC prices, for example, had come down at the same rate, you'd be able to buy a PC for uh, well less than a dollar. And so what you've seen over that time frame is, you know, genomics uh, has come down in terms of it being accessible to most people. And that has been really helpful in this pandemic. Now, in terms of why do we need this, this surveillance infrastructure? You know, there's, it's become clear over the course of this pandemic that identifying the source of an outbreak is critical from a public health perspective and a national defense perspective, because we need to be watching for the next coronavirus that could cause a pandemic. We also need to be watching for emerging antimicrobial resistance. We also need to be watching for bioterrorist attacks. One of the scarier moments was the realization, you know, midway through last year that, you know, we've had, you know, the, the SARS-CoV-2 virus circulating in the US for months at the beginning of the year before we even identified that it was here. And so there was a realization that, you know, we need to do much better in the future from a public health perspective so we can move more quickly. And the quicker you do the interventions, the more likely you are to contain the pandemic. And so we need this surveillance infrastructure to identify a pandemic more quickly. Again, uh, both pandemics that are sort of natural, but also potential bioterrorist attacks. Right. So, I mean, you, you bring up a point that actually leads to the next question I wanted to ask you, which is about what we have learned from the past year to um, move the field forward. Because I think we have seen how powerful genomics can be, but we have also seen some shortcomings. We've seen how the US has been ill-prepared, for example, to surveil for variants 
uh, we've we've seen really interesting genomic research into why some people are impacted more than others if they get sick with COVID-19, but we haven't really seen that translate to the clinic. So where are we in the field and do, what kind of roadmap has the pandemic laid out in terms of where we need to be going? The pandemic has really pointed out that uh, genomics is a fun fundamental, a foundational building block for a public health infrastructure and again for a defense infrastructure uh, for a company. And we've learned a number of things along the way. The first thing that we've learned is that it's important to have a global surveillance network and that it's not enough to have a national system um, or even a regional system, that what, what happens in a market in one place in the world can matter to the whole rest of the world. And so one of the things that we've been doing at Lumino for the last year even is donating sequencers and consumables to some countries in Africa, for example, that have never had sequencing in the country before. And so we're partnering with philanthropies like the, Gates, the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation to make sequencing accessible around the globe. So one big lesson we learned was that this is a, a global issue and needs uh, global cooperation that ultimately until all of us are safe, none of us are safe. So first thing we learned is that this is a global issue and that we need to think about a solution globally. Second thing we learned is we need a proactive surveillance infrastructure that today's system requiring manual notifications from hospitals if they see an outbreak is just frankly too slow. And, and relies on too much serendipity uh, to, to have the outbreak uh, uh, no, uh, uh, observed. And so we need a, an automatic and an automated infrastructure that's looking for the pathogen. And so there's a lot of interesting technology, for example, to look at wastewater systems uh, around a community and around the world to see if we can identify early outbreaks that are happening especially if you can combine that information with information from things like network thermometers, where you can see spike in uh, the temperatures of people in a community. Now, all of that is anonymized information, but it gives you early warning about an outbreak that could be happening in a community in a city. So another learning was, we need to have uh, global surveillance infrastructure. We need genomics-based surveillance to identify pathogens early. We need to get that genome as fast as possible because what we've seen now is that that's what allows us to develop the diagnostic tests quickly, the vaccines quickly, the therapies quickly. We've seen the promise of genomic medicines like the mRNA vaccines, and I think we'll see a lot more of those in the future. And then there was a lot of questions over the last year around, well, do you actually need to do more sequencing of the virus. And what we learned over the last year was that it's not enough just to get a yes, no, that somebody in my community has the disease or not. It is important to understand the strains that are emerging, how they are spreading, and that information needs to be collected. And one of the things we're learning, for example, is that it's important to sequence about 5% of the positives so that you can identify what strains are emerging, and then you can test your uh, your diagnostics, your vaccines, your therapies against uh, against the strains that are emerging. So that's another thing we've learned. We've also learned that that needs to be durable, that it's not just about this pandemic. It's about watching you know, for the next threats that are emerging. And in this way, the pandemic and, and the role of genomics in infectious disease is similar to the clinical role of genomics in a number of other areas, in, in cancer treatment, for example, in genetic disease diagnosis, in non-invasive prenatal testing, where a lot of the great research in genomics that has happened over the last decade, decade and a half, is starting to show great clinical promise and great therapies have been developed, but we're still very early in the rollout of those therapies and those tests of gen that genomics has enabled. So I'd like to talk a little bit more about genomic surveillance, because I think that's very relevant to the moment we're living in. So you mentioned that 5% number, which I believe the UK and some other European nations are hitting. The US is definitely not hitting it. And I know one of the snags has been that, you know, to some extent, it's the pipeline problem. We have all of this sequencing capacity. You know, I know Illumina has been doing some of that sequencing, for example, but there's not a great system to get the samples from labs to places that can do the sequencing. And so you also mentioned stuff like um, wastewater testing. So this, this genomic surveillance system you're imagining in the future, do we get rid of this pipeline altogether and just test the wastewater, how, how would you envision this, this working to make sure that we do have a comprehensive set system that can monitor for emerging threats of all kinds? It's a really great question. And there's a lot of learnings from this pandemic and a lot of thinking 
uh, happening right now about how we could create this system uh, in a robust way for the next pandemic. So here are some of the things we've learned. We've learned, for example, that, that you do want to have, again, this proactive monitoring uh, to see if an outbreak is happening. And look, there are outbreaks happening all the time. And so you want to see is an outbreak uh, expanding or is it getting contained? And then you want to identify the pathogen driving that outbreak. Um, and, and so to do that, there's a lot of thinking around, well, how do you get access you know, to the samples? How do you understand if something's emerging in your community? And so there are various approaches that are being looked at as looking at the wastewater systems, as we talked about, you know, sampling on a daily basis, wastewater in diff from different communities to see what pathogens are emerging in a community. Uh, you could do sampling of the public uh, uh, health systems and the hospitals and the blood banks. There are ideas also about uh, uh, doing uh, sampling of animals to understand you know, what's happening with the, uh, with the animals uh, that are in close contact with humans and what pathogens are emerging. And so those are ways you can get access to you know, the, the samples in that final mile, if you like. The other thing is, look, we know that there is sequencing capacity around the world. Uh, we at Illumina serve customers in over 140 countries around the world. You know, there are you know, over 10,000 uh, uh, sequencing instruments out there around the world, uh, well over 10,000. Uh, but the difference between countries that have done really well in terms of surveillance and the countries that are not as, as far along is the countries that have done well have had a, a national uh, effort to do sequencing. And so, for example, we're partnered with the government of the UK. Uh, they made a, a decision very early, so in, in sort of the March-April timeframe of 2020, to roll out COG UK, which is a national sequencing-based surveillance infrastructure. And they're the ones that are doing five to 10%. And so what you had was very clear national leadership, you had funding for the effort, and, and, and you had clear guidelines around how the data was gonna be generated, how the data was gonna be shared. All of those things, it turns out, are essential. And so we saw countries uh, following the UK's lead, uh, we're, for example, partnered with the government of Australia, and they're rolling out a national sequencing effort. And that's happening around the world. Uh, we're seeing sequencing being stood up from, uh, from New Delhi, India, all the way to Argentina. And so countries are standing up their own. The U.S. has been behind, and there has been there's plenty of sequencing capacity here in the U.S., but what's been missing has been this national leadership around uh, making it a priority, providing funding you know, for the labs to do the sequencing in addition to the diagnostic testing, and then very clear guidelines around how the data should be shared, you know, where it should go, what the formats are. Now, we're really encouraged by what's coming out of the Biden administration in terms of identifying surveillance and sequencing as a priority, as well as an allocation of budget to, to uh, support the sequencing work. Uh, and so we're making progress and, and certainly we're seeing the amount of sequencing now ramping up here in the US. But those are the kinds of things it takes to make sure that you have a successful surveillance effort. Right, I think there was one point not that long ago where, where the tiny West African nation of Gambia was doing more sequencing per capita than, than the US was. Um, anyway, I would like to talk a little bit more generally about how we turn DNA research into clinically useful insights. In, in the pandemic, for example, we've seen some research that uh, people with certain blood types or genetic genes that indicate they may have a certain blood type are more likely to have severe disease. Uh, we've, we've begun to see progress in some areas of disease, but I also think that the field has not moved as quickly into the clinic as some people might have expected. So what needs to happen there to turn more research into clinically relevant insights? Yeah, so if you think about how the field of genomics has evolved, you know, the first human genome uh, was sequenced and, and that sequence was published, you know, 20 years ago. Um, and so, you know, uh, we had the sequence complete and then uh, we had uh, access to, for the first time ever to a human genome. That uh, took 15 years and $3 billion to do. And so in that time frame, we've gone from a $3 billion genome to a $600 genome. So the technology has, has developed astonishingly quickly, and we've seen much more democratized access to genomics. The first decade of genomics was really focused on research. And so we at Illumina, for example, were really focused on serving academic and research customers who were trying to understand how a genome translates into human health 
and human disease, trying to connect your genome to traits, to predisposition to disease. And we saw some amazing research done over that first decade, decade and a half. And then it was really about 2013, 2014, where we saw the first clinical applications of genomics emerge. So one of the first big ones to emerge, for example, was non-invasive prenatal testing. And the idea was that you should be able to gauge the health of a of, of a baby and a pregnant mom by doing a blood test of the mother rather than doing the amniocentesis, right? So that's a five and a half inch needle that goes into the, the belly of a mom and between half and 1% of the cases could actually cause a miscarriage. And what uh, researchers found was that just by looking at a blood test from the mom, you could actually more accurately tell about the health of the baby. And so NIPT emerged as the first genomic test entering the clinic. and and quickly became one of the faster adopted uh, clinical tests in uh, diagnostic tests in, in the US ever. And so that was the first success story of genomic testing. And since then, we've seen a number of other applications emerge. In cancer treatment, for example, we know that cancer is a disease of the genome. And so what you've started to see is the emergence of these personalized therapies, and people use genomic testing to match cancer patients to the right therapy that will have the best outcome for them. Similarly, genetic disease testing, about 5% of people are born with genetic diseases. <clears throat> Today, on average, you know, those people go through a, a diagnostic odyssey of about seven plus years where they're tested multiple times, often misdiagnosed a couple of times. You know, 9% of those families go bankrupt. What we found is that if you actually test the baby while it's still only a few days old and do whole genome sequencing on the child and the parents, you know, maybe 50% of the cases you can get a diagnosis right away and avoid that multi-year diagnostic odyssey. Um, and so you're seeing some of those applications emerge. Now, to drive faster adoption, you know, we've been working with the payers to put insurance uh, and, and, and make sure that there's reimbursements in place, training the doctors. A lot of the doctors, the average age of the doctors in the US is over 50 years old. So a lot of them went to med school before the first genome, genome was sequenced. And so we're doing a lot of work to sort of drive the adoption through physician awareness, patient awareness, uh, and also putting reimbursement in place around the world to drive the adoption of the US test. But we are at the very beginning. You know, it's hard to say that because we see so much traction already and there's so much momentum. But the reality is long term, we believe your genome will be the fundamental element of your health record, that it will tell you, you know, the pre predisposition to diseases, you know, uh, it'll tell you what drugs will work for you. We know, for example, that 95% of people have, uh, have variants that mean that most common drugs will either not work for them well or cause adverse reactions. And adverse drug reactions cost the U.S. about $30 billion a year. And so it'll be the, cor the corner of, uh, you know, helping you decide what drugs will work for you. It'll help you identify if you have uh, diseases like cancer early through blood tests. It'll help you choose the right medication and monitor for recurrence. So we're at the very beginning. Uh, I truly believe that genomics is one of the most transformative forces I have seen in my lifetime. So that's the future of genomics. Uh, what's the future of Illumina? You know, uh, our mission from the very beginning was uh, to improve human health by unlocking the power of the genome. You know, we were founded uh, just over 20 years ago. Uh, and, and our mission has been the same throughout. And we're continuing to be focused on that. What that translates to is, you know, we do a lot of innovation. We spend about 18% of, of our revenue on R&D, uh, focused on making instruments that provide better, faster, cheaper sequencing and democratize access to genomics. You know, and there are hundreds of fields that we think could leverage genomics, from cancer to agriculture, all the way to data storage. We're working with Microsoft, for example, and companies like Twist, because DNA provides an incredibly efficient mechanism to store data. You could store all the data on the internet in uh, in a shoebox of, of, of DNA. And so there are hundreds of fields that uh, will leverage genomics. And so our focus is to continue to drive to create the world's best sequencers and enable all the brilliant people that are using uh, genomics and our tools in their fields. Well, Francis, I thank you so much for being here uh, virtually with me today. It's been a pleasure. Thank you, Kristen.